This video is brought to you by Raycon. Accessibility is something that comes up a lot when talking about how games draft in new players. That might sound like steps that need to be taken so that people with disabilities can play your game, but I'm thinking a little more broadly than that. You can have the best game of all time, but without a method of telling someone how to play it or who these characters are and why you should care, you're gonna have a really hard time. There are games out there that don't try to explain what's going on, and sometimes this is okay, but most of the time I, I just need a bit of a guiding hand to point me in the right direction every now and then. Does that sound desperate? I hope it sounds desperate. But hey, who needs a guiding hand when you've got some sweet new wireless headphones? And thanks to this video's sponsors, Raycon, I can say that these headphones are doing a great job in that regard. Despite being wireless, you never lose any sound quality, and so you can dance the mid-morning away in your back garden while your phone is lost somewhere in the house. This actually happened, by the way. Don't judge me. These things have some chunky bass to them, all right? Raycon headphones are discreet and yet are available in multiple different colors to suit your preferred style. And this is all without those annoying dangling wires that tend to get tangled up in your pocket. We all know them, we all hate them. The fact that these headphones start at about half the price of other premium audio brands makes it an incredible opportunity, and that's before Black Friday rolls in and the deal gets even better. Be sure to click the link in the description below or go to buyraycon.com forward slash rabid to get access to Raycon's Black Friday and Cyber Monday deals because guys, it's gonna get silly and you'll want to be a part of it. Anyway, I need to find my phone. The real challenge here is how to approach this video, since I could demonstrate example after example of games that knew the best way of teaching a player how to play without outright explaining every tiny detail, but I think the more entertaining video to make is about games that kind of just throw you in at the deep end and expect you to know how to swim immediately. Because it's quite hard to do that. And fuck knows I can't do it. Having little to no clue what you're doing at the start of a game can of course be a great benefit if given the right kind of setup. Video games have often been used as a means of escapism, and adventure games have offered an accessible way of exploring an exciting world full of wonders and scary monsters. A lot of adventure games, especially open world games, can trace their origins back to the first Legend of Zelda, where you've got the freedom of Hyrule to explore as you please, and the lack of any immediate direction lends itself very well with this kind of adventuring. You don't know where you're going, and you don't really know what's going on, so you might as well enjoy yourself. But for how much longer? You have to give the first Zelda game a lot of respect for what it achieved at a time when games weren't even coming close to achieving such a grand level of scale across a detailed world. But 1986 is an increasingly long time ago where demographics and attitudes towards this game were very different to what they are now. Has it held up after all those years? Mm, not really. I feel reluctant to say that in the first place, since The Legend of Zelda on NES is such an important stepping stone for so many different areas in gaming history. Without it, we wouldn't have one of Nintendo's flagship franchises that recently culminated in a game that harkened back to this very video game, we likely wouldn't be as obsessed with open world games as we are now, and hey, it might have taken a while to get save features in gaming too. So Zelda 1 deserves a lot of respect, and I'd hate to undersell its contribution to history, but it's a 33-year-old game at this point, and this, this exhausts the hell out of me. Zelda 1 is designed to encourage as much exploration as possible, and it achieves this by plonking you down at the bottom of a huge map, near enough to a cave where you can find a weapon to defend yourself, and then told, um, save the world, I guess. Yeah, I'm sure it'd be easy if I know where to go through some kind of process that isn't based on trial and error, and have enough patience to deal with setback after death after not having enough bombs, and at some point, you start to accept that some of the hand-holding that later games deployed isn't so bad. It's fun to have so much freedom, but I could've used like 20% of Navi to help me out. Desperate times and all that. The need to explain how to play a game becomes exponentially more important when you're playing an online game. 
It's one thing being confused or bodied by a group of NPCs because you're not 100% sure what's going on here, but it's significantly more dangerous to skimp on the tutorials when you're dealing with a potentially huge player base of differing skill sets. Playing an online game for the first time is already a daunting experience since it can easily feel like you'll never catch up, but this is compounded further when the game makes little to no effort to help you on your way. Maybe learning by doing is the best method, but I'd argue that Team Fortress 2 would be a hell of a lot easier to understand if its tutorial was A, any good, or B, remotely functional half the time. Or you could load up a match, die a dozen times, and learn very little. Ooh, so many great options! TF2 has been churning out online matches since 2007, and while it's impossible to tell how much of the current player base were regulars in that time, I think it's safe to say that there's been a huge amount of matches played in that time. It's a shame then that Team Fortress 2 has only ever done less than the bare minimum required to teach any new players how to play, a fact that is made more apparent if you were to play it for the first time nowadays. The learning curve was always likely to be steep as all hell when you're coming up against more experienced players with thousands of hours under their belts, way steep in unusuals, but Team Fortress 2's tutorials are so bare bones that Valve might as well not have bothered. I mean, it's nice to know how to fire a weapon and how to move your character, but TF2 is a complicated animal with half a million moving parts and this just isn't gonna cut it. Plus, this tutorial isn't working most of the time, so the only real option is to throw yourself in at the deep end and spend hours drowning until you suddenly learn how everything clicks together. At least it's rewarding when you do finally learn how to play Team Fortress 2 and you don't feel like you're so up against it, especially when it's just a quick refresher after Overwatch stopped being fun. It's fine, it just gets good about 10 hours in. Apparently there's nothing wrong with that. Obviously not every game ever made needs a tutorial. Older arcade games never needed a huge bible that detailed every small piece of critical information for getting the most out of your rudimentary space shooter, since these games were extremely intuitive and didn't ask you to factor in half a dozen variables at the same time as shooting bad guys. Here are the enemy, here's you, and if you get hit a certain number of times, you die. These are simple rules to understand and not something that requires step-by-step -step instructions in order to keep up. You might imagine this is a byproduct of retro games and their simplistic aesthetics, but I'd invite you to take a quick peek at Dwarf Fortress and to try and make sense of it. It's been out since 2006 and after many years of trying to understand it, combined with some hefty play sessions here and there, and a few too many trips to the relevant wiki articles, it still looks like fucking manifested chaos. Kojima, is that you? There really aren't many games out there like Dwarf Fortress. It's a simulation game where you construct an underground fortress with your army of dwarves, but there's also combat and roguelike procedural generation and text-based graphics that make everything feel a little bit indie. So if you were to take any aspect of this game and recreate it, it would just remind people of Dwarf Fortress, including the fact that this game is really fucking complicated. Of all of Dwarf Fortress's qualities, user friendliness is absolutely not one of them. There's a wonderfully detailed game in here that opens up into a compelling tale of unique storylines and the reality is that no two playthroughs will ever be the same simply due to how many variables there are at play here. Getting into Dwarf Fortress is one of the most rewarding experiences you can have of a video game, but it's also one of the most daunting. It is a tricky game to get to grips with, and juggling so many variables usually overwhelms a new player extremely quickly. Plus, the graphical style means it's harder to understand what's going on at any one point, and you'll typically suffer because of it. Dwarf Fortress doesn't try very hard to help with this, which might seem like madness considering the complexity of it all, but I honestly feel like it's a better game because of it. The lack of any real tutorial practically forced a community to grow and help others understand the ins and outs of Dwarf Fortress, and it's actually refreshing to find a fanbase who aren't at each other's throats all the time. Yes, it's an intimidating prospect where you'll likely fail and die repeatedly, but that's okay because the official motto is, losing is fun, so you can't say that the devs didn't see this coming. I never realised that dismembering a group of dwarves could ever have this much to it. A 
I hope everyone's taking notes at home because there are some wonderful case studies here into how to leave a player to fend for themselves and slowly introduce themselves and become familiar with a game at their own pace. Arguably, there are better ways of ensuring that a player has everything they need in order to have fun with a game, but if it works, why change it? Because sometimes it really doesn't work very well at all. We understand a lot about game design now that wasn't immediately apparent in the early days of game development. Not to brag, because game developers figured things out mainly from making a ton of mistakes and learning from games that made a ton of cash, and so most games realise that you need something in place to give a player a fighting chance of understanding how to play. Whether that was a tutorial or some levels that slowly introduced new concepts and mechanics, or even just an instruction booklet in the game case to remove all possible doubt. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde for the NES in 1988 could have used with more help than that, and doesn't take long to notice that. Everyone needs to play this game at some point in their lives because it'll change everything that you thought you knew about how little effort a game can put in in order to teach a player what the fuck is going on here. Nah, don't worry about it, it's really simple to understand, you see? Dr. Jekyll is your standard unassuming gentleman with a cane, and when he gets angry, he hulks out and becomes Mr. Hyde, who is slightly more aggressive and likes to throw his weird projectile out and defeat enemies. And I can say this with a small amount of confidence because I've read what other people have said about this game. You show this to the average person, and what would you honestly be able to decipher from it? You'll take damage from random sources for reasons that science can't explain, since I'm sure that some of these characters were intended to be friendly, because one of them will remind you that if you enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe for more and click the bell for notifications of every new video, but you never get that sense from playing it. Seriously, play this game and see how long it takes for you to break down and look for an extensive guide, because I'm convinced that it's an impossible task without it. It shouldn't be a hard game to make, and yet, here we are. I'd be furious. I'm acutely aware that it might get a little dull if I list off a bunch of games that couldn't be bothered to explain how to play them, since after a while, they might all start to sound the same. I suppose there's some variety in the sense that not all of these games chose to be deliberately vague with how to play them, but I think the only logical step to end the video off with is to talk about a game that actually works really well, even though logically, it shouldn't. Few games have ever gotten the most out of tiny amounts of information as Shadow of the Colossus, where you're thrown into a world that you don't know anything about to do a task that you barely understand for reasons that are only ever hinted at. It's so weird when you reflect on what you do in this game that you're never told so much information that would have done a lot for fleshing out the world and investing you more in your quest. And that's the whole point. Shadow of the Colossus is a game that is somehow tonally consistent and dissonant at the same time. It follows the typical archetype of venturing into a strange land to slay some monsters to save a love interest, and yet, with only a tiny amount of information to help you, any feelings of heroism and triumph are only presumptions made by the player. This game plays of existing tropes that dictate that you don't need to know these creatures' names because they're mere obstacles in the way of you reaching your goal. Even if the goal in question is very questionable in nature and may involve some kind of deal with the devil that may take its toll on you and the world around you, maybe a quick peruse of the history books would have been helpful. And yes, Shadow of the Colossus does technically explain how to play it by means of sharing a bit of information as you climb your first cliff face and topple your first behemoth with a welcome guiding hand so you don't forget what all the buttons do, but after that, you're basically on your own. You're told roughly where the next Colossus is, and the game uses them as a framework for teaching you different techniques like horseback combat and using your environment to weaken the enemy, but beyond that, you're not exactly flush with help or intricate backstories. And with Shadow of the Colossus' oppressive tone and sense of isolation, this feels like it was a genius creative decision. It's fun because you don't have to care about anything, but maybe you should. This is Rebel Luigi, and the tonal inconsistency in Shadow of the Colossus is what makes the lack of explanations so effective. It could go into great detail and explain the backstory of every Colossus that you killed in order to make you feel like a piece of shit, which is how you should be feeling, but it gets there organically without the need to bash you over the head with all this information. It doesn't need to explain anything because it's self-explanatory, and yet you kill them anyway.